<laughs> Thank you, Brother Joseph. Hallelujah. Now I believe. Now I Father, we are grateful to Thee again tonight because that You have been with us through the day and have guided our steps, and we are assembled together again tonight in the name of the lovely Lord Jesus. And we are here under great expectations. We are looking now for the time that You will uh, give us the climax of this gathering together. Amen. That when you will heal the sick, Amen. all the afflicted people tonight, may there not be a feeble person left among us tonight. May their faith move up, Lord, from and don't look at their troubles anymore, but to the one who has, is the remedy or the cure for their troubles. And God, we pray that you'll break the bread of life to us afresh from thy word that will encourage us, for faith cometh by hearing, and that the word of God. And we will praise thee, for we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. You be seated. So glad to be back here tonight. I just passed by the door out there a few moments ago, and there's a great multitude of people milling around walking up and down the streets and the, the bus driver said that or the pardon me the cab driver said them people didn't come to church did he i said yes sir they can't get in i said the people claim that people don't like to go to church they, but they they i believe that the gospel yet is the is, is the greatest drawing power there is on earth Amen. yet in simplicity we had a great time at the Full Gospel Businessman's Breakfast this morning. The Lord did bless us. He met with us there in a great way. Amen. They had sold, I believe it said, 1,700 tickets, and they let in 300 more, and then they couldn't let no one in more, and they stood in the aisles and around the doors. And, and the Lord, when we made the altar call, gave us many to rise to receive eternal life. So that we're very thankful for. And... Um, and then I want to thank some brother. He couldn't get in out there, I don't think. And he, he gave Billy a while ago a, a carton of 22 bullets for me. I got them back here. I'll enjoy them. Sure. Thank you very much if you're outside and can hear it or inside, whichever it is. Uh, certainly, um, that's been a great lesson to me. Uh, sometimes target shooting. and I, You have to have something to kind of let off the pressure. And So that's the way I, I do it sometimes when I get... A chance and can my I run out to the range and shoot a little while just merely to let off the steam. <laughs> you, I believe Jesus said, "Let's come apart into the wilderness a while." Amen. Now we love you so much, and tomorrow is a uh, Sunday, and everyone wants to go to church on Sunday, and I'm know or pretty sure you all know where the the I'll try to say. Stone Church, it's Rock Church, is. That's uh, the church that's sponsoring this meeting, I guess, and the others are visiting here. And you strangers that's out of town has come into the meeting. And if you don't, now if you have a post of duty, you go there. That's what you're supposed to do. Always stand at your post of duty. Uh, that's, your, that's your duty to God and to your pastor, to the rest of the congregation. But if you don't have any place to go, 
I'm sure you'd be certainly welcome at the Rock Church for the, I guess they've announced the services. And, um, and you people get saved in these meetings, we never know. Now, the, we usually make an altar call, what we call an altar call. See? And that's, that's all right. I have nothing against that. That's good. But I believe if you'll remember the scripture, they, they didn't have an altar call. As many as believed. See? They were added to the church believers. And, um, and if you don't have a church, well, I'm sure that Brother Vic would welcome you to his church or any of these other men around here. If you haven't had Christian baptism yet, consult them. And don't stop. Just keep on going. Just keep pressing on. We never know. Never even know how many is healed. And you pastors, brethren, just remember, when the meeting's over, maybe weeks, Somebody come up to you like a little lady and say, you know, I used to have a lady's trouble that isn't there no more. Uh, somebody, uh, uh, you know, all at once I just didn't want no more cigarettes. It just all left me. See, they, they're healed so many you can't call them. It's just everywhere. And I've never had a meeting yet, but what that was the results afterwards where the Lord healed the people and they wasn't conscious of it right then. But they, they got all right. And first thing you know, there's... Uh, they just get up and walk away and it's all over but maybe they don't understand it right then but it's uh, by and by it's over I remember in Finland long ago I guess there's Finnish people here there was a little boy had been raised from the dead you probably raised, uh, read the book of it the news running all into Russia and I saw it in a vision before it happened two years and told it across the nation I remember that little Finnish girl that night standing out there in the hall, and she had a, one leg was about six or eight inches shorter than the other, and she had a big build-up shoe with a, a strap around her, and one in her toe, a little hook, and she had the, the belt over her shoulder and come across this way and down into the toe of her shoe. She had two crutches, and poor little ragged-looking fella, and every time she'd go to move, she'd have to lift that foot up with her shoulder, that strap, and then shove it out like that and set it down and then put the crutch down. And uh, we had this, was that what to call them? I, the Finnish brother, sister here, I, I don't pronounce this right, Masahali. And it run all the alphabets and it let about 20,000 come in or whatever it was and then have them go out and let me speak to another 20,000. And um, a little boy had been raised from the dead at Copio had been killed by an automobile. And oh my, uh, they don't broadcast rock and roll and things there. It's just news and things. So this got on the news. And they come all the way from Russia up in there. And I seen that night, that's right after uh, the war, about five years, I guess, after the war. And I seen Russian soldiers and Finnish soldiers with their arms around one another, loving each other, patting each other on the back. Anything will make a Russian pat a fin will settle war. That, that takes the love of Jesus Christ to do that. But those great big communistic soldiers standing there, we passed by a group of little Finnish soldiers, little fellows had never shaved yet, just slick face, and that big boots on coming down the street, uh, uh, watching the people. It's just it's crowded on both sides for city blocks, and those soldiers standing at attention, the tears run off their cheeks. They said, we'll receive a God that can raise the dead. They're human beings like we are. But what it is, things that professes Christianity and doesn't produce any results. They live as life. They want some reality. See? That's the reason communism is raised up because of the letdown of the church. The church is guilty of communism because it was the one who let down. And now, just think only 1% of Russia now is communist. 1%, 99% of the people are still Christian. What they need is a real on fire with a prophet with thus saith the Lord that, that, to drive the communistic force into the sea. What we need, we need the real Christianity. And these Russian soldiers standing there that night, I come into a little vestibule and into a little hall. And this little girl, I never forget her. She was, she was a little ragged hair and little skirts ragged and she'd come out of the, the ladies room and 
they were told not to bother me. I uh, get out on the street and buy candy. I, I have children myself, and I, I like children. I think anybody who doesn't like children, there's something wrong with them. <laughs> and so this uh, little fellow, as I'd have a string half a block long, I'm far you know, giving them candy. They'd give me some of that money there, and it was no good here. Great big bills like that, and I'd buy candy. I don't know what I was buying, but I'd give it to them. And, then, and they asked them on the streets, you know, if I walked around, just kind of go ahead and ignore me, I guess. So get a little exercise, and then when I come in that night, that little girl thought she'd done something wrong. And I know she ducked her little head. And she looked up out of her little blue eyes, and she was going to see what I was going to say. And the two soldiers in front of me had went on to the door, and they were singing, Only Believe. Two more was behind me. I motioned to them, Stop. I want to see what that child would do. She's about, I guess, about eight years old, ten. I learned later she's a little Finnish war orphan. Her father and mother had been killed in the Russian war. And um, so I, I looked at the little fella, and... And she had these crutches, and she thought that I had, she had done something wrong, you know. And uh, I looked at her, and I said, you want to see me? And, of course, she couldn't understand English. And I motioned my finger to her, come over there. And she raised up her head and looked kind of childish-like. She put these little crutches out and raised her little limb up, coming like that. And here she come, walking over. I thought, I'll just see what the child does. And I just stood there like that. And she got real close to me and she looked at me and looked up like that and looked down. I thought, I'll just see what she does. And she picked up my coat, looked at it in her hand and kissed my coat pocket and put her hand down. I was going to say to her, my little sister, and I didn't know how to talk and looked out in front. I seen her running down the street just as normally as any child. And I said, now I couldn't talk to her. I said, honey, uh, Jesus Christ makes you well. And she pulled her little skirt out, typical little finish, and said, Ketus. That means thank you. See, for kissing the pocket. I, I believe I've been the biggest hypocrite in the world. God would have honored that child's faith. And so she, uh, uh, I thought, well, she'll find it out after a while anyhow. See, it'll go on. She'll be all right because I done seen her in the vision. It has to be. Well, I, it just, it has to be. So that night, uh, there had been so many things the Lord had did, and I was just about ready to leave. And I said, well, just call a few more. And uh, my brother said, no. Said, your, and Brother Baxter said, you're worn out now, Brother Bram. Said, now, you just, you just quit now. Come on, because we got to go somewhere else. And said, you just, I said, well, I just feel maybe have about four or five more. There's so many here. And so the next one in the prayer line was that little girl. <laughs> The Lord just knows how to work things this way. So I said to Mrs. Isaacson, she may be here now. She was my voice of Finland. And um, so I said, now you just say the words that I say. She said, all right. And I said, honey, the Lord Jesus heals you, rewarded you out there for that. What you did, I said, now you go over there and have some of the men to take those braces off. Just watch what happens. And she hobbled across the platform, and I kept on with the rest of them. In a few moments, here she come with the shoes, braces over her head. This is normal, both limbs to take a beat. Run up and down the steps. See? Faith. Faith. Love. Finds its place. That's right. I had a little experience today, and just to show you what fellowship means. I would, the last time here in New York, or, uh, I was over here at... Uh, Brother Hudson, I think, and that, well, I, mean, I don't think that was in New York. That's, I don't know which is New York around here. It's just all New York to me. All the way from Tucson here. <laughs> looks to me. So then uh, I used to come here with Sister Brown and Brother Berg. I'm sure many of you know them. And I've been trying to get a hold of that dear old saint for the last day or two. And there's no one in church. And then today... I got her on the phone. I got a hold of the janitor. And, wow, I thought I was talking to a 16-year-old girl. She's got so much spring in her voice. I said, "Uh, Sister Brown, you'd never guess in in a month of Sundays who this is. And she said, bless your heart, I sure wouldn't. And I'm just as happy she'd be. I said, Brother Brown. And she just started screaming. Just such a sweet old thing. 
and she's 83 years old and preaches twice a week. And just think she entered the ministry before I was born. And I was about ready to give up. I was getting so old. I took new courage. And I told her I would share with Brother Vic over here. And the nice things that she said about Brother Vic. I tell you, uh, uh, that, that makes us real Christianity. Both of them big churches right here in New York. No competition among them. <laughs> Just really brothers and sisters in Christ. I tell you, that means a whole lot for the pastor, you know. Both of them here are old churches established like this and still just brother and sister working hand in hand. That's the way we should do it. That's very fine. I think that's complimentary to Brother Vic, uh, his great work here for the Lord and his great feelings for others and both of them. The Lord let them live a long, long time. Yeah. And Brother Vic, I thought we were getting pretty old, but we're children. <laughs> we're just children. I remember Brother Bosworth when he was dying. He's 84. I said, I'd like to burn my old car up and getting down there to see him. And I see him raise up his little bald head. He raised his arms out like that. I just fell right in his arms and screamed, My father, my father, the chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Hallelujah. And I said, Brother Bosworth, I want to ask you. I said, Are you sick? He said, No. I said, Well, uh, uh, what's the matter? He said, I'm just going home. You know, his sense of humor. And um, uh, I said, well, Brother Bosworth, I said, I'd like to ask you something. When was your best time? He said, right now. And I said, yet you know you're dying? He said, I can't die. He said, I died about 70 years ago. He said, he said I, I'm a new creature in Christ. And he said, Brother Branham, all that I have lived for for the past 60 years has been the Lord Jesus. And any minute, I'm looking for him to walk in the door and go with him for eternity. I thought, I remember Paul Rader. How many, how many of you remember Paul when he died out there? And they called, they had the Moody Bible uh, Institute. I believe he sent down a, a little quartet to sing for him. And they were singing, Near My God to Thee, you know. And he said, he had a sense of humor, you know. He said, who's dying, near you? <laughs> He said, he said, say, he said, raise up them shades and send me some, send me some good snappy gospel song. And they got to singing, down at the cross where my Savior died, down there for cleansing from sin, I cried. He said, that sounds better. He said, where's my brother? Luke. Well, Luke didn't want to see his brother die, so he's in the next room. He said, go get him. Luke and Paul travel together like Billy Paul, my son, and I travel together. And Luke come in. Tried to brace himself up and took a hold of Paul's hand. Paul reached up and got him and said, Luke, we've come a long ways to the other hand, we brother. He said, Yes. He said, But think of it. In five minutes from now, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ, clothed in his righteousness. <laughs> oh my. That's, that's, let me go like that. That's it. Clothed in his righteousness. In five minutes from the time he's holding his brother's hands, I'll be standing in the presence of Jesus Christ. Clothed in his righteousness. He squeezed his brother's hands and went to meet him. Oh my, what a day that'll be, them gallant soldiers. See, I stand here and talk to you and all my time's gone. And <laughs> yes, that's the way it goes. Nine o'clock. <laughs> but I'm going to hurry tonight, sure enough. <laughs> just got just a few little scriptures, uh, write down scriptures and know where to refer to. And that sometimes make a write out a name and then ask Brother Vail what it means for coming in, you know. Get out of the Bible here and you tell me how to pronounce it. And um, so I like a whole lot in education. <laughs> but I promise tonight to pray for the city. Now, my main purpose, my, my meetings, is the reason I don't have too many times, once or twice maybe doing a campaign, I'll bring the people up like I'm going to tonight without the discerning because just to lay hands on the sick. Many people believe that. Now, that, that's, that's good. That's the Scripture. But you remember, that was kind of the Jewish tradition. See, Jeriah said, Come lay your hands upon my daughter and she'll live. But the Romans said, I'm not worthy of you come under my roof. Just speak the word. Watch what he testified. He said, I'm a man under authority. He's a centurion. And I, I say to this man, go, and he go, and this one comes, and he comes. What was he testifying? That just Jesus' word was enough to heal his servant. He had power over all sickness. 
You just say the word, my servant will live. He turned around and said, I never found faith like that in Israel. And now that's where I try to get the people to believe. You know, many people say, oh, glory to God, brother so-and-so laid hands on me, hallelujah, I got, well, that kind of looks like the brother had something to do with it. See? Now, if you can just recognize the presence of Jesus Christ, see, and let, it's his hands that count, see, and just accept him. Then nobody laid hands on you but Christ. Amen. You touched him and his hands touched you. See? And no man gets praise anywhere. It's all the praise because that's all can be done. Anyhow, if we take any praise, we're robbing God from it because it, God's the one that does the healing. And remember, there is no such a thing as any, any man be doctor or minister that's a healer. I'm the Lord thy God and heals all thy diseases. See? All, no medicine heals. It's not, no doctor claims medicine to heal. No, no. Medicine only keeps clean while God heals. Medicine cannot build tissue, cannot mend the bones, see. Uh, you might cut appendix out, but who's going to heal the place it come out from, see. You might pull a tooth, but who's going to heal the place it come out of, see. See, it, God's a healer. He's the only healer. The Scriptures doesn't lie. They're perfectly right. So he's the healer. I'm very grateful for all the, the things that we got, like medicines that they can think of that'll kill germs. Nothing against that. I pray constantly for that. Uh, but we get someplace we don't have any medicine to help the case. And then another thing, sometimes a medicine that'll help one will kill the other. See? But I know a toxin. That's an absolutely not a remedy, but a cure. That's the blood of Jesus Christ. Faith in that blood. Now, tonight, oh, we, uh, did Billy, I forgot to ask him, I run in, did he, uh, get, he give our prayer card, did he? Or did, if he didn't, I was going to have him do it now. Um, we uh, go to just talk a little bit about faith and then, uh, then go right ahead and call this prayer line up and pray for the sick by laying hands upon them. Try to get every person in the building if we can. Now, you have faith now. now. I want you to give me your undivided attention just for a few moments as I read this word. And now, I want to read from St. Matthew's Gospel, uh, the 15th verse, the 15th chapter, rather, beginning with the 21st verse. And this is a... Um, not too much scripture to read, you see. It's a little bitty text. But you know, uh, it, it, isn't the, the, it isn't how much, it's the quality, of, not the quantity, the quality. See, there's uh, enough on there and then a few verses there to save the whole world. Amen. Sure. See, it's not, it's not the size of it, it's what it is. The... I was telling here some time ago, a, a little boy, I believe it was in this state, that was searching around in an old attic and he found a, a, an old postage stamp and, and he knew a stamp collector, so he, he took it down to find out how much it was worth. And the stamp collector said, oh, of course, the little boy had ice cream in his mind, you know. He said, I'll, I'll give you a dollar for it. Well, my, that was, the sale was made right away. I think he sold it for about... Um, I think it was 500 and it went on to the last time we heard of it I forget how many hundreds it was worth you see the little old stamp of paper wasn't the thing it's just an old piece of paper not even worth picking up but it was what was on it that counted that's the way it is here this is just a piece of paper but what's on it is the word of the Lord and that's what makes it so valuable alright 21st verse then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not, I am not sent but to the 
unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, It is not meet for me to take the children's bread and to cast it unto dogs. She said, Truth, Lord. Yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee even as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, just for a few moments in the way to make a, to build on this, I want to take a text to say what I've written here on these scriptures. I want to call uh, a pers- the word perseverance. And just one word. Persevering. Now, we know the word, I think, uh, uh, it means to be persistent. And uh, persistent in something that you're doing and making a goal or something. You have to be persistent. And man through all ages that's had faith in what they're trying to achieve had to be persistent. Especially if you're trying to do something right. Because... You're going, to meet, you're going to meet an opposition. You people tonight, it's going to be prayed for. I'm saying this for your glory, for your understanding. If you're not ready to come in a prayer line, don't come. Because you must remember that this is the time when God is going to take you at your word. And you've got to take Him at His word. And it doesn't matter what anyone else says or how you feel, your feeling has nothing to do with it. Jesus never did say, did you feel it? He said, did you believe it? You must believe it. And your healing is already secured. Jesus Christ healed you at Calvary. And no matter what your trouble is, you must accept it. And before you can accept it, you've got to believe it because faith is based, uh, healing is based on faith. And faith is based on the Word. Now, you can't say, if I touch this microphone, I'll be healed. There's there's no basic to that, see? That's in your mind. But when it's, uh, thus saith the Lord, then you can know that's true because all heavens and earth will pass away, but His Word will never be changed. So it's true. Now, you've got to be persistent. No matter how much the devil tries to tell you what you're just feeling is bad, don't you believe one word of it. Here some time ago, I was called to a bedside, took out of a meeting and called to a bedside where there was a, a young boy dying. And the old father came to me, it's been about 15 years ago, I guess, and he said, would you come to my son? He's, he's dying with uh, a horrible thing. It's a, a disease of the heart. I, call, I believe it's called uh, some kind of a, a heart disease. I forget what the name of it is now. But it's real, real bad. And so um, I said, yes. Oh, I beg your pardon. It went on to his heart, but it was polio that was in his body. It was polio. And uh, that's before we had the salt vaccine. And then uh, the boy was real bad. And so when I went to pray, the doctor wouldn't let me in. And he said, I can't let you in. And I said, well, uh, I'm, I was about 40 years old. And I said, well, I, I'm 40 years old. And I said, I, my faith uh, tells me that it's all right to go pray for this man's boy because he wants me to, to pray for him. He said, but look, he said, you're a married man. You have a, a child of your own. You'll pack that polio to the boy. And I said, well, uh, let me go in. He wouldn't do it. And the man himself, the doctor, as I understood, was Catholic. I said, I want to ask you something. If I was a priest and this man was Catholic and that boy was dying, would you let me go give him the last rites? He said, that's different. That's a priest. I said, no. I mean just as much to them as a priest would to the man who was a Catholic. And finally he said, it's, if you'll sign this paper, I said, I'll sign anything. See? 
And so he dressed me up like a Ku Klux, and I, and I got in there. I didn't mean to say that like that, forgive me. But anyhow, white and all over my face. And I went in there, and the boy was so low till he was just uh, barely breathing. And he had been unconscious about two days. And I don't understand medicine and the great uh, uh, scientific researches that God has let man do, doctors for sick people and so forth. But there's some kind of a, a cartogram or something you're taking. And his heart was so low, I forget just what the beat was. It was just about gone. And so uh, the mother was standing there. And I spoke to her. So I got on the other side of the bed and the little nurse. Oh, some nice little lady. Uh, she, I guess she was in her early 20s, maybe 21, 22 years old. She was the nurse that was uh, attached to the, or had to take care of the patient. And um, so I um, went across on the other side of the bed and knelt down. And I just, a little simple prayer, laid hands upon the, upon the boy. And I said, Lord Jesus, this father and mother has brought me here to pray for their son. And he's dying. And only you, Lord, can help him. And I know that you said these signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay hands on the sick, they shall recover. I plead that promise to you, Lord Jesus, for the sake of this boy's life. No change come at all. I said, I thank you, Lord. And the old father raised up and said, Lord, I am so grateful to you, ever grateful for healing my son. And he reached around, the mother fell into his arms, and she said, Dad, think of it. He's going to be well now. And I stood and looked. And they were happy and rejoicing and weeping. The boy was just as low as he could be. They said, oh, it's wonderful. And the little nurse looked around. She looked at me. She said, I, I believe you misunderstand the doctor's orders. She said, I believe you misunderstand. The boy is dying. Oh, the old man said, no, he isn't dying. He's going to live. And uh, so uh, she said, look, sir. said, I, I appreciate anyone having faith like that. But said, how can you laugh and go on like that? Said, and you see, there's no difference in the boy. And said, the boy will die. Said, he can't live. Well, we don't see how he's lived this long. Said, it's never been knowing in, in, among uh, the sick people or science, brother, that uh, a person ever went that low with a heartbeat like that, some kind of a cartogram something, that ever come back again. And I'll never forget that old man. He put his hands up on her shoulders just like a father to a daughter. He said, look, my dear child. He said, that cartogram is what you're looking at. That's what you're trained to look at. And that's all you know about that cartogram. He said, I'm looking at a divine promise. <laughs> the boy's married and got three children now. <laughs> it depends on what you're looking at. He never got any better for two or three days. But after a while, the first thing you know, here he comes. Right out of it and went home. He's a missionary in South Africa now with three children. Now... See, it just goes to show you've got to be persistent. That never bothered that old man that settled it just as when that woman touched the garment of Jesus Christ, that settled it. That's all. She, she was persistent till she got there, but that settled it. You must be the same way. You must be persistent. And anybody that's ever got anything and ever been able to achieve anything has been persistent. George Washington was persistent at Valley Forge. Amen. All the odds is against him. And uh, the enemies across the river. But after all night in prayer, and the American soldiers with no shoes on their feet, about one third of them had shoes. And they crossed the river at Valley Forge to the ice, and three musket bullets went through his coat. But he had an answer from God. And there was no need of him backing down. Nothing could stop him then. He crossed it because it, he was persistent. He had heard from God. And that's the way we've got to be. If God says so, that settles it. Noah was very perseverant after he had heard from God. When he heard the word of God tell him to build an ark, he built it. No matter what anyone else said about it or how anyone else thought about it, Noah was persistent. They might have said, oh, that old man, that rain story and so forth. The old fellow is just 
or stayed up there in the sun too long. There's something wrong with him. That didn't stop him at all. He didn't hear a word of it. He just only heard it. God said it's going to rain, build an ark. And he was persistent in doing it. Now, Moses was very persistent. First, a running coward. He had been educated. Oh, he could even teach the Egyptians wisdom. He was so smart. And yet he failed on the job. It took 40 years to put the education in him that Pharaoh would give him. It took God 40 years to take it out of him before he could use him. Out in the wilderness. And sometimes we have to get emptied up before he can be filled up. And now he'd been a failure and he'd run out and married this beautiful Ethiopian girl and was and has settled down and had a son, Gershom, and go to fall heir to Jezreel's sheep and everything. He long forgot the feeling of the people. But one day, while I was on the backside of the desert traveling down a familiar old path, he saw a bush burning. Now, I never tried to examine the bush and said, I believe I'll go over and take off a few leaves and take it down to the laboratory and see what's the matter if they don't burn up. And uh, they've been burning there for an hour, but... They, they don't seem to tree be consumed. If he'd have thought that, it never talked to him. But he drew up with this in his heart, that he would go to find out. And the boy said, take off your shoes for your own holy ground. I want you to notice, one day he's a running coward, and the next day <laughs> he's a, a radical. The next day when he left Egypt, when he had the whole army in his hands to deliver the people. And you know, when you hear the voice of God, it makes you act funny, do things funny, odd and peculiar. I just think he's 80 years old now, probably beard hanging down to his waist, maybe his bald head shining, hair around his neck. And here he's on his road down to Egypt with his wife setting a straddle of a little mule and the baby on her hip, a crooked stick in his hand, eyes up, just praising God. What an odd-looking sight. Where are you going, Moses? We're going down to Egypt to take over. A one-man invasion. <laughs> you couldn't stop him. He was persistent. Why? He had heard the voice of God. That was enough to make him persistent. An old man, 80 years over, is going to take over the nation, and he done it. He had heard the voice of God. How is he going to take over with that stick in his hand? A trained army of million men, standing there, more than a million men, had conquered the world in that day. And here goes an old man, 80 years old, wife sitting on a mule, and a stick in his hand, going down to take the nation over. Why, people thought he was crazy. You know, when you hear the voice of God and hear the Word of God, you are kind of crazy to the world, but if you hear the voice, you know what you're doing. Amen. And nothing is going to stop Moses then. He was on his road. He was very persistent. Even when Pharaoh, he stood before him and threw down the stick and it turned into a serpent. And the magicians came and could do the same thing. Moses didn't run out like a coward. He stood there. He knew God sent him no matter how many carnal impersonators that the devil could bring up. He stayed at his post of duty because he'd heard the voice of God. He just stayed there and watched the serpents crawl. And after a while, his serpent come over and eat the rest of them up. Amen. What happened to them sticks that the serpent eat? Where did they go to? Figure that one out. All right. David, after he had trusted God and saw the Lord God being with him that helped him kill a bear, single-handed, and all saw a lion. And then he got a courage up that God was with him. He knew God was with him because God had done something for him. God's done something for you. He saved you. That's the greatest miracle there is. Now he's ready to do something else. And the time came that when Goliath made his boast, what well, David said, you mean to say that the, uh, you'll let that uncircumcised Philistine stand there and defy the armies of the living God? What's the matter with you fellows? Well, Saul was the most able man among them, head and shoulders above his army. 
And this David was just a little runt, a little bitty fellow, ruddy looking, kind of a, a boy, like a little stoop shoulder, little sheep herder. And so uh, Saul said, I admire your courage, son, but you remember that man's a warrior from his youth, and you're nothing but a youth. He said, but thy servant was keeping thy servant's sheep one time, and a bear come in and took one. I went after him, and the Lord delivered him in my hands. said, a lion went. And said, I knocked him down with my slingshot. And when he got up to roar against me, I took my knife and caught him with a beard and killed him. And said, how much more will the Lord God deliver that uncircumcised Philistine in my hand? Amen. And if God saved your soul from a life of sin, how much more can he take that cancer? Notice, little old David. Saul said, admire your courage, but you're not a fighter, but if you want to go... I'll dress you up. So he took his armor off and put it on him. While little old David, with all that Ph.D. and D.D.D. hung on to him, he, well, he found out that Saul's ecclesiastical vest didn't fit a man of God. So he said, I've never proved this stuff. Take it off of me. Let me go the way I want to go. For what I know is right. Oh, my. And here he goes. And he was persistent that he had take. Goliath, and he did, and he slew Goliath. I think of his sheep. There, David was such a loyal man to his post of duty. And this lion, which could have killed him easy, come in and took one of the father's sheep and went out. And he didn't have nothing really to fight the lion with, but a little slingshot. You boys know how many times I've had to pay for a window. A little piece of leather with a string, you know, and ram this rock around and sling it. And uh, we used to knock these old snake doctors off the fence and things and, and uh, throw it with these slingshots. That's all David had. Wouldn't hardly kill a rabbit. But we find out that David, whatever he had in his hand, it wasn't very much. But he had courage. And he knew that was the father's sheep. And he was... He was uh, sent out by the Father to take care of these sheep. He was responsible for them. And now he took whatever he had in his hand and took out to get that sheep persistently that he had taken away from that lion. Amen. Did you ever see a lion, what it looks like? You've seen these in a cage. Well, they're, they're kittens. You ought to hear one in the jungle. The, these fellows around here, they've been in cage and captivity. You hear one of them roar, it sounds bad. You ought to hear one out in the jungle hunting him. No, it, He's hunting you too. Then, oh my, he's a great fella. When he roars, the beetles, monkeys, baboons, and jackals, everything stops. He's a king. And they give him room. But here David goes with this little slingshot to bring back that sheep. And he did it. Oh my, how I could take a text on that for a few minutes. Yes, sir. You're the God's sheep too. Disease has took a hold of you. I ain't got very much, not, not even a slingshot, but I got the word. I'm coming at you tonight to bring you back. I'm coming to rescue you with the word of the Lord. I don't know nothing about medicine and cutting off with knives and things, but this I proved. I know that this is right, so I'm coming after you, sheep, to bring you back to the shady green pastures of God's help. God help me with this little slingshot. David had it wrapped in, uh, in his fingers. And he had five stones in his hand. What is that? F-A-I-T-H. N J E S U S. And here he comes. <laughs> and he brought back the sheep. <laughs> Now, that's the way we're doing tonight, having faith in Jesus and persistently. We're going to stand on His untouched Word, and we believe that God will keep His Word. If it doesn't, then we're all lost. Every Word of God is punctuated with an amen to the believer. Right. Yes, He was persistent. And also, Samson. When he met those Philistines, did you ever think of that? Well, Samson, they've got him pictured as a man having shoulders like barn doors. Well, it wouldn't be no, no secret to find a man like that could pick up a lion and tear him in two. 
But Samson was a, forgive me for this expression, I'll just make it like, he's a little curly-headed shrimp. Just a little mama's boy, seven little sissy-like curls hanging down. Hey? Uh, what? And you remember, he was a weakling until the Spirit of the Lord come up on him. Then he took the lion and tore him to pieces. That's right. First the Spirit of the Lord up on him. Then he knew where he was standing. And if the church can only get anointed, anointed with real faith, and that line roared, I guess Samson shook. But the Spirit of the Lord come up on him. He was persistent, said, I'm ready to meet you. Grabbed that line, pulled him apart, and threw him over to one side and walked on. He fenced him in one night, and he picked up the gates of Gaza, put them up on his shoulders, and walked up the top of the hill with him. My, oh, my, what a man. A little shrimp like that. But the thing of it was, the Spirit of the Lord was up on him. He was, that's what made the difference. Then... One day he was surrounded by a thousand Philistines. And there he was. There was nothing he had, so he picked up the jawbone of a mule. Probably been dead for 40 years or more. His real old dry bone. And those uh, Philistines had on helmets and coats of what they call nail, which is great big laps of steel or brass. A helmet about an inch thick. And he picked up that jawbone of that mule and killed a thousand Philistines. Did you ever think, take that old dry jawbone off the desert there and strike one of those helmets while well, that jawbone would go into a thousand pieces? But he stood there and threw them steel helmets and them with spears. Just beat them right and left till they beat down a thousand the rest of them run up the rocks. What was it? As long as he could reach back there and feel them seven locks. That was God's covenant. There wasn't nothing going to bother him as long as he had that covenant promise. And nothing can bother the church of the living God as long as we can feel that Holy Ghost, the covenant of God, Lord, in our hearts, the Pentecostal blessing. For in the works that I do, shall you do also? The life that's in me will be in you. As the Father has sent me, so send I you. The Father that sent him, come in him. The Jesus that sends the man, goes in the man. It isn't the man, it's Jesus. It wasn't Jesus, it was God. As the Father sent me, so send I you. Lo, I am with you always, even to the consummation. I'll be with you to the end of the world. And the works that I do shall you also... A little while, and the world won't see me no more. Yet ye shall see me, the believer. For I'll be with you, even in you, to the end of the world. Jesus Christ. As long as I can feel that Spirit of God around, something's going to happen. I can see people that will believe it, that will reflect the praises and glory of God. Every time you look at the moon, it isn't the moon shining. It's the sun shining on the moon. If I can say, moon, what makes you shine? It's just not me shining. Something's shining on me. I'm supposed to keep the light going in the absence of the sun. And the church is a type of the moon. We're supposed to reflect the light while the absence of the Son of God because we are sons and daughters of God. The lesser light. And as long as we can see that moon reflects the same kind of light the sun does. Oh, it isn't, it isn't the people, it's God in the people. I used, when I, used to, I was a game warden for several years. I love animals and I, I like to take care of them. So I, I, I was a conservation officer for seven years. I used to pass by an old spring. That was the best spring I ever drank from. I always liked it because it's so jolly, always bubbling up, just bubble, bubble, bubble. And I thought, my, I lay down and drink. One day I thought, little spring, what makes you so happy? Is it because that rabbits drink from you? If he could speak, he'd say, no, that doesn't want to make me bubble. I'd say, maybe a deer drinks from you once in a while. No, that isn't what makes me bubble. Well, I'd say, little spring, maybe it's because I drink from you about once a month. I'd say, no, that isn't it. I'd say, well, what makes you bubble like that all the time? If he could speak, he'd say, it isn't me bubbling. It's something behind me making me bubble. It's bubbling up. 
And that's the way the Holy Spirit is to the believer. There's something behind you. You can't push it, carry it. It takes care of you. It's the one that does the bubbling. Something within you. As Jesus told the woman at the well, uh, wells of water bubbling up into everlasting life. Regular geysers just spraying up the joys of God to your soul all the time. And as long as the church could feel that around them, what you're, what you're scared about? I mean, Samson didn't fear. He was persistent. All he had was a, a, a jawbone of a mule. But he was persistent because he knew his locks still hung there. The doctor might have told you there's not a chance for you to get well. You're dying. You've got cancer. But as long as you can sit here and feel the glorious resurrection of Jesus Christ, what difference does what the doctor says now make sense? You be persistent. He'd appreciate you. He's a good doctor. He'd tell you that he wants you to get well. That's what, that's what he wants you to do. And you must do it. To have faith, you must be persistent. John was so sure that he had seen the right sign. He, he knew God told him. He didn't know who the Messiah was. He's so persistent. And somebody might say, well, don't you think this is him? He said, I'll know him when he comes. He was so sure that he said, this is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He knew it was. He testified to it. I saw the Spirit of God descending from heaven upon him like a dove. And I know that is the Son of God. Persistent. Oh, we could go on and on with characters. This little woman, she was a Greek from the country of Serhiopia. And we find out that she had, must have heard about the praises and glory of the Lord Jesus. Faith cometh by hearing, hearing the Word of God. She heard. And when she heard, you know, faith finds sources that others don't see. Now, if you don't have faith, well, then it, it, there's no need to try to show it to you because faith can see it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Faith sees what other blind people doesn't see. Faith is the sixth sense. Five senses are fine as long as they don't disagree with the sixth. But the sixth sense is faith. It's the substance of things hoped for. You don't see, taste, feel, smell, or hear. But yet you know it. Faith tells you so. And it's so sure that it really comes to you a substance. Not just imagination, it's something you have. I see people come on the platform and say, Brother Branham, I've got all faith. Well, what are you doing up here then? See? <laughs> see? Uh, I don't have it. And, uh, but there, when you got, when anything, you've had things to happen, you just knew it was going to be, yet you didn't know how it was going to be, but it's going to be. That, that's faith. That's Amen. real faith. It's going to happen then when you know that it's going to be. Now, Faith finds a source that others don't see. His word is a sword. The Bible said so in Hebrews 4.12 that it is a sword. But it takes an arm of faith to yield that sword. Only faith can do it. Hold the sword. She had many hindrances, this little woman. Now, she had a daughter that was, uh, was having epilepsy. And she was very, very bad. And she had heard that Jesus healed epilepsy. Now faith cometh by hearing, and that was her child. So she was determined to, to get down somewhere and hear Jesus. And now uh, she had many hindrances, just many, many hindrances, but her faith didn't have no hindrance. Tonight, people have lots of hindrances. If you, your mind has lots of hindrances, but your faith... There's nothing can stand in its way. Faith knows no hindrance. Let's just think of some of the things that might have happened to this little woman. They might have said unto her that you are a Greek. In other words, your denomination is not sponsoring that meeting down there. You don't have any right to go down there. Well, if that would have been in her mind, she wouldn't have sat very long anyhow. She, the jug would have filled up and she would have left. But we find out that didn't stop her, whether she's Greek or not. She had faith. That's all she needed was faith. Now, somebody might have come to her and said, 
Well, the days of miracles is past. There is no such a thing. Those people are just a bunch of, of fanatics. But still, she was persistent. She was going to go anyhow. Let's think another. Some of them might have said, well, you know what? Your husband is a, is a notable man here in the city. And if you be caught down there with that group, well, your husband will actually leave you. But still, she was persistent. She had faith and had a need to use it. Some of them might have said, well, if you go down to the card game or whatever kind of a amusement you go to, the people will laugh at you. She was still persistent. And then that old thing might have come to her, you know, the pastor will put you out of church if you go down there and get mixed up in something like that. But that didn't stop her. She was still persistent. She was going anyhow. Why? She had struck faith. Faith's going to do it. I don't care what others think. Faith does it. Finally, she made her way through all these obstacles, and she arrived at Jesus. Now, seemingly, all the trouble was over. She arrived at Jesus, but it wasn't. It was just starting. Many people would say, well, if I know Jesus, yes, we see that every night. <laughs> see? He comes right with us each night, proves himself to be here. But still, we come back the next night with all of our troubles again, you see. Is that right? Amen. Now, that's right. She arrived to Jesus. So perhaps maybe if she hadn't had that kind of faith, the first discouragement after finding Jesus, why well, she would have been, she would have blown up, went back. But you see, faith won't do that. Faith won't turn it loose. Faith is persistent. It holds right on. Now watch. She had all confidence and faith in this man. Now, if she'd just been mocking or just saying, I'm going down and give it a try, I'll see what he's got to say. If he says something against our creeds, we'll, we'll just leave, that's all. But she come to get something. And she was determined to stay there until she got it. There you are. That's the person. Like the Queen of the South we preached on the other night. Notice, when she got to Jesus... Instead of getting a welcome, she got a turn down. Now, when you what you think of the people today would get to that spot and to be treated like that, Jesus told her right quick as she come through all these barriers and finally, her Daddy, she said uh, she come to him and she ran to him to worship him and said, "Thou son of David." Have mercy on me. My daughter's very vexed with the devil. And I know that you're the great healer. And I've come to, uh, to ask you to help me. He just ignored her, looked at her, and walked on. Ooh, my. Mm. She's a little more than our modern Pentecost. Mm. My. They'd have turned up their nose and walked back and said, I don't have to do that. But not that woman. She had faith. She stayed right there. Now... She went at him again. Lord, can I just have? And she wasn't thinking about what she'd come through. She wasn't thinking about what she'd have to go through. The only thing she knew, she believed. If she could get him to say so, that's all she needed to know. Amen. If he'd say so. She knew it was working on others. Why would it work on hers? You fight every inch of the way. Amen. God down in Egypt, give Palestine to the Jews. But they fought every inch of the way. God told Joshua, everywhere the soles of your feet rest uh, that I have given you. Footsteps meant victory. Possession. Just as far as you could climb into the kingdom of God, if you just want to climb a little piece and say, well, I believe I may not have to go to hell, but I believe that I'll be saved at the end if I join church. You ain't got much ground yet. But every promise in the Bible is yours. But you'll have to fight every devil guard away from it with the two-edged sword and claim it for yourself. Be persistent walking right into it. Now she got right up to the very God himself. And he ignored her. And she ran after him crying. She's persistent. Lord, help me, she said. She worshipped him and said, help me. Listen to that rebuke. I'm not sent to your race. Oh, my. Then a lot of them got up and said, Well, I guess he wasn't sent to us. This revival don't. Guess I'll go away. 
See, Jesus knows she had that kind of faith. See? And another thing he said, your race is only a bunch of dogs. Ah, don't talk like that to the modern Pentecostals. You say that, they say, well, I'll just leave this bunch and go join the assemblies. And the assemblies say it to me, I'll go to the others and the others and the others, you see. But not that woman, she had faith. Said, you're, I wasn't sent to you. I wasn't sent to your race. And besides, you're nothing but a bunch of dogs. It's not me for me to take the children's bread here and cast it to you bunch of dogs. Mmm, ah. Now don't stop faith. Faith's still there, just as fresh as it ever was. What does faith admit? The truth. She said, that's the truth, Lord. Oh, my. See how little you can get, not how big you can get. Faith makes you little. Notice, still she was persevering, yet he wouldn't pay no attention to her. He ignored her, and finally she got in his way, and he couldn't get around her. And then he told her, said, I'm not sent to you, and you're to your race, and your race is a, nothing but a bunch of dogs, and I'm not going to take the children's bread. It's not right for me to take the children's bread, healing to this group, and give it over to you dogs. And she said, that's the truth, Lord. Faith will always admit the word is truth. Amen. <laughs> See, if you've got real faith and the Bible tells you that you're doing wrong, you'll admit that you're wrong. Amen. You won't say, well, wait a minute here, I belong to... No, no, that's not faith. When the Word says it, that, you, that's where you're right or wrong is by the Word. That's right. Now, she said, uh, no, sir, that she just couldn't uh, believe that she could stop at that. So away she goes, and she said, truth, Lord, uh, we're nothing but dogs. But I'm only asking that I could just get some of the crumbs that falls from the Master's table. She was crumb hungry. Just think of that. Today, we either get the whole loaf or we won't take any at all. See? We've got to be all of it or we don't take anything. Still, she was persistent. She went right on. She was not a hotbed plant that had to be babied and sprayed over to keep the termites off. No, sir. She wasn't one of these high breads like the modern crop of today that call themselves Christians. When the Word of God said it, she believed it, she seen it vindicated, she was ready to go at it regardless of what anybody said. Even Christ Himself couldn't stop her. That's what faith does. Oh, that amidst the Word being right, she's hunting for crumbs. Remember, she had never seen a miracle. she come out of a denomination that didn't believe in miracles. she believed in a come out of a denomination that said there is no such a thing as miracles. She's a Gentile. She'd never seen a, a miracle in her life. But yet, when faith takes a hold, God's there. She'd never seen it, but she'd heard about it. If you don't believe his miracles, read the Bible. And there are promises to us today. Faith took a hold. She was something like the harlot Rahab. When she heard by the spies, she didn't want to see Joshua and See the way he dressed and what kind of a warrior was? She said, I have heard that God is with you. I have heard what God did. And she wanted salvation and she got it. Right. Because she was persistent also. She said, I'll hide you. I'll do anything. But one thing I want you to swear to me, that I'll be saved during this time. Oh, my. That's the idea. This poor woman was the same. She, uh, she wanted... Uh, she knew that she was going to get it. There was no doubt. No matter what she had to climb through, she was going to get it anyhow. So Jesus couldn't even turn her back. But calling her a, of a, the wrong race, calling her a dog, it wasn't right to take the children's bread and feed dogs and so forth like that. But still she went right on after it anyhow because she was persistent. She had a need. Her daughter was dying. Others had been healed, so why couldn't her daughter be healed? That was the God of creation. Jesus said, for this saying, the devil left your daughter. Oh, my. She had the right approach to God's gift. Do you know God does things sometimes just to, to do things a different way and just to find out what people do? Ah, uh, it's over your head. You haven't seen it and haven't noticed it. But I've done something just now to do something. 
Now, so help me. And I watched it work. They were, uh, you say things. You change your, your, your attitude. You change your voice. You change sometimes your sermon. Watching and seeing certain things. Then watch and see how it acts. Because the prayer line's fixing to come up. It would be better for that not to be among you. See? Just to see it happen. Then you change yourself and go back somewhere again. See? God did that very thing. He still does it. Noticing. She had the right approach to God's gift. And remember, she was the first one, the Gentile, that God ever done a miracle on. She was the first Gentile. Faith admits the word is truth. And it's reverent. Very reverent. And that's what, and perseverant. And that's what it is. Martha, when she went to meet Jesus, now if there's anyone had a right to condemn, it would have been Martha. Because she had sent for Jesus to come pray for her brother when he was in a serious condition dying. And Jesus, they had left the church. They had come out of the old dead movement that they were in. And had followed the Lord Jesus, believing him to be the anointed Messiah. And then his very friend, Lazarus, that he come up with. And they had uh, been excommunicated from their church and from society. And his very friend that he come up with was laying sick at the point of death. The doctor could do him no good. And she sent for Jesus, and Jesus just simply ignored her standing. And he went to another city. And he did the same thing there. They sent again, and he just ignored it and went on. And then after Lazarus was dead and had been buried four days, his face had already fell in by that time. That hot country, the nose falls first, as I'm told. And probably his flesh had already fell in because after 72 hours, corruption sets in the body. And uh, so we find out I got to bury a man in a few days. Wednesday, he died last Wednesday. And they just locked him up, just waiting there for me to come to preach his funeral. Probably they couldn't hold him out any longer because his, uh, his face had fallen in. See? And that's what was happening to Lazarus. He was already dead. And then after he was dead and it was all over, then here come Jesus slipping into the city. So then they know that it's going to get criticized because perhaps it's already criticized. But Martha, she'd been very dilatory seemingly. She about fixing a place for Jesus to sleep, place for him to eat and so forth. Even asked Jesus one time to make her sister come help her. But down in her heart, Faith struck. While Mary sat still crying and doing nothing about it and give up, Martha slips out of the out of the house and down through the city. No doubt she met some on the street and said, Where's that uh, divine healer that you had around here? What about Lazarus now? She passed right on by. She got to where he was at. Watch how she was. She ran up to him. She had a right to abrade him. She had a right to tell him, saying, Now why didn't you come? When I called you. If that would have been a, a Pentecostal of the day or a Baptist or Presbyterian, they'd change churches right quick. Sure. Why didn't you come when we called you? Uh, she had a right to, seemingly, but she didn't have a right to. As I said last night, you've got no thought. It's his thought. Amen. What he does. Thy will be done. Pray like this. He's not an errand boy. He's God. Amen. Notice. Uh, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. And when she got to him, she approached him in the right way. She said, give him his right title, Lord. Not upbraid him, but Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. Oh, my. I can see him pull his little tired body together. And, and he said... Um, if you'd have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Amen. See, she knew what the God of creation was. Amen. She knew he was the anointed Messiah. She approached him right upon her knees. Said, Lord, if you would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Amen. Oh, if we could only think that. Even now, Lord, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. He said, uh, 
I am the resurrection and life. No other man could ever say that. I am the resurrection and life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? She said, Yea, Lord. I believe that you're the Son of God that was to come into the world. He said, where have you buried him? I was talking to a woman not long ago, and she said to me, she said, uh, I, I, I like to hear you speak, Brother Branham, but said, there's just one fault you have. I said, thank you. Just one fault. I said, what's that? She said, um, you brag too much about Jesus uh, being divine. I said, I hope that's the only one he can find in me. I said, uh, you brag too much about Jesus being divine. said, he wasn't divine. I said, oh, yes, he was divine. Amen. She said, well, you make him God. I said, he was either God or the greatest deceiver the world ever had. Amen. And I said, he was God. She said, he was just a man. He couldn't have been God. I said, he was, he was God and man together. Amen. And she said, you said you believe the Bible. I said, yes, ma'am, I do. And she said, if I'll prove to you by your own Bible that he was not divine, would you accept it? I said, certainly, if the Bible said he wasn't. But I said, I don't believe it's in the Bible. She said, in St. John, the 11th chapter, the Bible said, when Jesus went down to the grave of Lazarus, the Bible said he wept. And said, if he wept, he could not be divine and weeping. I said, well, lady, that won't stand up. I said, I want to tell you, I said, that's thinner than the broth made out of a shadow of a chicken that starved to death. I said, because that won't hold up to the Bible. I said, look, he goes down to the tomb. And he stood before the tomb and he said, straighten his little body up and said, Lazarus, come forth. He might have been a man crying, but when he called that man out of the grave that had been dead four days and his soul a four days journey somewhere, I don't know where it was at, neither do you, so anyhow he called him back, crushing to its master, the soul to its creator, and a man had been dead, stood on his feet and lived again after being dead four days. That was more than a man, that was God. It was a man when he come down off the mountain that night and was hungry, looked all around over a fig tree to find something to eat. He was a man when he was hungry, but when he'd taken five biscuits and two fish and fed 5,000, that was more than a man. He was a man when he was laying out the back of that boat that night where 10,000 devils of the sea swore they'd drowned him. And that little old boat in that storm like a bottle stopper out there somewhere, floating up and down like that. He was a man when he was asleep. He was tired. Virtue went out of him. But when he put his foot up on the brail of the boat, looked up and said, Peace, be still, and the winds and the waves away. That was more than a man. That was God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He was a man when he died on the cross crying for mercy. That's right. But he was God on Easter morning when he broke the seal to the sea. Oh, God, put a seal on the house. Yes, sir, they were living to make intercessions. Every man and woman that ever managed a hill of beans believed that. Yes, sir. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Believe us out of this. Yes, sir. He's just as great right here among us tonight as he was then. Believe us out of this. He's the same healer tonight he was then. Believe us out of this. He can't fail. Be persistent. Hold your position in Christ, your confession. Hold fast your confession in Christ. She was persistent and she got the resurrection of her brother. The Shunammite woman was persistent in the presence of Elijah. Elijah come by and blessed her and told her that she'd have a son. The son got about 12 years old. Out in the field he must have had a sunstroke. This woman had been very kind to Elijah. She was a Shunammite woman. And she uh, came from the land of Shunam. And she found out, she said to her husband, being a rich man, she said, I perceive that this man that passes by here is a holy man. She said, let's do him some kindness. Let us build him a little room on our side of the house here when he comes by and put him a little bed and a pitcher out there so he can rest himself. Her husband said, that'd be very nice. So uh, you do something to these little ones, you do it unto me, Jesus said. So he said, told his servant, 
Gehazi said, go ask her, can I speak to the captain or what can I do for her? She said, no, I dwell among my people. And I'm all right. And Gehazi said, but she hasn't got any children. He said, go tell her there come a vision. He said, go tell her about this time she's going to bear a child. And she did. The boy got about 12 years old. His, his father being old, he was out in the field one day. He must have had a sunstroke. It's about noon. Been a cry, my head, my head. He sent the boy in and laid on his mother's lap until he died. Look what an appropriate place. She took him out in that room where that prophet had laid on that bed. And she said to the servant, uh, saddle a mule. And you take out to Mount Carmel. Up there there's a den somewhere where this preacher's living. He was the one who had the power to see a vision, said the that I would bear this son, and if he's close enough to God, he's God's messenger of the hour. And I know if he could tell me why, if I get to him, he'd tell me what God took the child for. Let me get up there. She said, if anybody salutes, don't you salute, and don't stop. Just keep going. Oh, I like that. The urgent's time now. People are dying. We ought to be fooling around the road. Get going. And she's persistent. And Elijah, you know, God don't always tell his prophets everything's going to happen. He looked up and he seen her coming. He said, here comes that Shunammite. And said, she's full of sorrow, but God's hid it for me. He said, run, meet her. And she, he said, is all well with thee? Is all well with thy husband? Is all well with the son? I like this. That persistency until she got into the presence of the messenger. Amen. And she said, all is well. Uh, her husband wringing his hands and walking up and down the room uh, crying and the baby laying on the bed dead but all is well. <laughs> wow, she'd come to the, her goal. She'd made her goal, her persistency that she could get to the man of God, the man of God could tell her why. Amen. And then she fell down at his feet and revealed what was happening. Now, he reached over and got his staff and said to his servant, Take this and go lay it on the baby. Now, I think that's where Paul got laying handkerchiefs on the people. See, because Elijah knew that everything he touched was blessed. Amen. But if he could get the woman to believe it. But the woman's faith wasn't in the staff, it was in the prophet. <laughs> See, and she said, As the Lord God lives and your soul never dies. See, she witnessed how he had eternal life. Said, and I sold over to us, I'm not going to leave you. Hold oh, on, stay with it. That's it. That's the way to get what you want. Like this Shunammite woman, like this Sophie Open woman. Stay with it. Stay right there. Stay right with Christ. Take a hold of it tonight and hold it. Just don't move. Tomorrow somebody say, oh, it's just, just shut your ears up to him. You got faith, you stay there. Said, so, I won't leave you. And Elijah said, well, I can't get rid of her. I might as well go with her. So he girded up his loins and away he went. Watch when he got into the room. He didn't know what to do. He never prayed. He just walked back and forth up and down the floor until he felt the Spirit of God come on him. Then he went and laid himself over the baby. And he sneezed seven times and come to life. Martha knew if God was in that prophet, surely he was in his son. See, and that's the reason she's could be persistent. And if we've had thousands of years of experience since then to know that God keeps His promise, how persistent ought we to be tonight when we can see the presence of Jesus Christ? Oh, my, and shine like the stars. I remember one night at home not long ago, there was a woman, and I didn't know the woman wanted to be prayed for. I didn't go down and pray for the sick that night, and it's so packed around the place, and some of my trustees are sitting in here somewhere tonight. Was there? This woman come from California, had a 50-pound tumor. She wouldn't go to the doctor. And then when they made her go, it was too large to be operated on a big water tumor. And she was way out like this, a great big tumor. And they brought her there. They, had, they couldn't bring her in the car. They had to put her in a trailer like to bring her. And they brought her in. I didn't know it. And I just went ahead and spoke. And she said, well, isn't he going? I made an altar call. I said, isn't he going to pray for the sick? said, no. She said, what door does he go out of? <laughs> now, I just think, her faith. And they took the woman around and packed her around to the back door where I go out through the pastor's study and went to my car. And the woman laying there, 
caught me by the trouser leg and she said, Brother Branham, hey, oh my, she was out like that, said, if you'll just lay your hands on me, God will make me well. Amen. And I did that. And about three months from then, I was in a meeting here. She stood just as perfectly normal as any woman in the country and invited any sister there to go with her into a room and undress and see if she'd had an operation or not. Why? She was persistent. She was determined to get what she come for. That's the way it is. Yes, sir. Their faith had a hold of the Word. Michael one time. When he's called in, when Jehoshaphat made an alliance with Ahab, that's when the believer and the unbeliever mixes up. And he said they wanted to go have war. They was going up to a place to take their own ground. Fundamentally, it belonged to them. He said, why should these Syrians be eating corn that belongs to Israel? Joshua, give us that. That's exactly right. So they went and had a big school of preachers down there, a whole seminary. Five, four, five hundred of them. Well-trained Hebrew man. And so... Joseph has said, being a righteous man, he said, but shouldn't we consult the Lord? He said, oh, yes, maybe that's so. Ahab, you know, what a fellow he was. So he goes down and said, I've got the answer. I've got 400 prophets. We'll bring them up here. So he, they got down there, and one of them, Zedekiah, I believe it was, and made himself two big horns and went up there saying, Thus saith the Lord. Yeah. <laughs> Go up. It belongs to you. Thus saith the Lord. You'll push them uh, Syrians come out of the country with these horns. Jehoshaphat looked around, you know, and he, he said, haven't you got another one? <laughs> another one when 400 trained Hebrew prophets from the school. What do you need but another one? Yeah. We've got 400, the whole seminary is here, and all of them with one accord, saying, go up, the Lord's with you. Thus saith the Lord. Joppa said, well, haven't you got another one? He said, oh, I got another one of my consult. So that's Micah, the son of Emmon. But said, I hate him. <laughs> oh, sure. Um, said, well, he don't even agree with these denominations. And he said, we, he, well, you have to, there's a strange fellow. They said, oh, I said, don't let the king say so. Don't get him. So they sent one of the fellows down and said, now, Micah, you know, you're put out of the association. You don't have fellowship with them no more. But now, if you will just say the same thing they do, they might give you your fellowship card back when he come back again. Could you imagine talking to a prophet like that? Micah said, as the Lord God lives, I'll only say what he said. Ah, oh, there you are. Hey. That's it. Well, you know what they could do for you. That doesn't matter. I'll only say what he said. He went back to him and said, Now you let me have tonight, and I'll see what the Lord said. He come back the next morning, and, and he said, Go on up. Yes, sir. Go on up. But I seen Israel like sheep scattered, having no shepherd. Uh, then this Zedekiah comes up and takes his hand and smacks him right in the mouth, that little holy roller, and uh, set him down and said, Which way the Spirit of God go when it went out of me? He said, You'll see. <laughs> so he said, what about, I said, I saw a vision last night. I saw God sitting up on a high place and in this his great high throne and said, the, all of them was around him. They had a council. Who can we get to go down and to uh, deceive Ahab, to get him up there to fulfill what the prophet Elijah had said? What can I do about this? And said, a lying spirit come up and said, I'll go down and get those prophets and cause them to make a lie. And the Lord said, you're the one that can do it. Because they were seminarily trained, you know. He said, you go do it. That's all you can do. Went down there and he did it. Now you say, well, who wouldn't know what was right? Micah was with the Word. How can you bless what God has cursed? How can you tell people that they can live like this and do these things and still maintain the fellowship of Jesus Christ? You cannot do it. You've got to be born again and filled with the Holy Ghost. But Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto your children and on the fall, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. That was a prescription. Amen. You don't want to tamper with that prescription. A doctor can write out a formula to you. And you take that to some quack druggist 
and he don't mix it right, you'll kill your patient. That's what's the matter today. You've adopted handshakes and everything else instead of that. Come back. God let Peter write an eternal prescription for salvation. It's never been changed and it can't be changed. Shaking hands and joining church and things will never take its place. It's not the word by word the way it's wrote there. That's the prescription they used all the rest of the way through the Bible. They used it all up to the Nicaea Council. And then they changed the prescription. That's when we got so many dead members today. <laughs> Truly, you've got to get the real prescription and know if it hit the target there, it'll hit the target now. Amen. It's for you and your children and them, it's far off even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Amen. Don't adopt anything to it, don't add any more to it. If you put any more to it, you remember a prescription's just enough antidote in there to take the disease and enough to kill enough of the, the medicine for the patient. And if you don't, you put too much of the of the antidote in there, something else that it won't work. Weaken it down too much, it won't help the patient. You put too much of the poison in, it'll kill the patient. It's got to be just right. And he wrote a eternal prescription. For it's for every generation. Amen. Not shake hands, join church, and all these other things. He said, repent. And then be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They took that prescription and fulfilled it at God's great counter. And when they did on the day of Pentecost, they healed the sick. They done everything that there was to be done. Because it was God, Christ in them. Amen. All right. Micah knew that that was the word of the Lord because it was exactly what the, the Bible, the real prophet said. Amen. God had cursed that man and cursed his wife because of their evil. And if they he had cursed it, how could these men come around and bless it? Here's where they got their idea. The land belongs to them. It actually was given to them. But their sins had drove them away from it. So they thought because the land belonged to them, and that's all they had to have. No, sir, it's on conditions. Absolutely. You can have divine healing. You can have salvation. You can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But that's on conditions. That you meet God's conditions. Outside of that, it's not for nobody but believers. A man said to me not long ago in ministry, he said, I don't care if you would raised and have doctor's statements of the raising the dead and everything else. That I don't believe it. I said, certainly not. It's not for unbelievers. It's only to believers. It wasn't given to unbelievers. It's only sent to believers. That's all it's for, is for believers, not unbelievers. Certainly, they admit there what, what's wrong. But Micah knew when he seen his vision was exactly with the Word of God. Then he knew it was right, and he was persistent, whether it took his life or not. He said, you'll find out when all this happens that I've said comes to pass, then you'll know where it's at. Amen. Same way the blind man, he couldn't argue the theology, but he knew his eyes was open. So he was very persistent about it. Like Philip, like Nathaniel. Woman at the well, they were all persistent as they got a hold of God. Now, in closing, we're going to start the prayer line just now in a minute. Just something comes on my mind just now to say. Not long ago, I was in Mexico. Down, the Lord had sent me down to Mexico City. It's that big ring there. And, oh, people were by the thousands, times thousands. And the night before, there had been an old blind man come on the platform. And I, it was one of the most horrible sights. It was a... I, how many knows Brother Espinosa? See, is oh, many, sure. Well, I, he was my interpreter. He can tell you this. And um, uh, there'd been a blind man come up on a platform, poor old Mexican, and their economics are so poorly balanced there. For instance, maybe a, a brick mason will get so many pesos a day, maybe, say, uh, uh, five pesos a day. I don't know what it would. And that's Pedro. And he gets, uh, he's a brick mason, so he gets five pesos a day, but he has to work five days by himself a pair of shoes, see? And their economics don't. What about little Poncho then? Uh, Chico, the little one, that has to work out here and only gets two pesos a day and got five children to feed. But they have to save enough out of that to burn a grease candle on a million dollar gold altar for his sins. That's what burnt me up. And so then, see him doing penance to dead women and crawling on their knees and things like that. So, 
One night, this old man come across the platform. He didn't have no shoes on. His hair was gray. He had an old hat tied up with strings. He was coming across the platform. I looked at the old fellow, and here I was standing with a nice pair of shoes and a good suit. He was blind. He was walking like this, and he said, uh, and he was, uh, kept saying something. Of course, I uh, can't speak just a few words of Spanish. He come across this way, and I got to him. I, put, I thought if nobody would see me, I, I put my foot out like this to see if my foot, my shoe would fit him. It was, I was going to slip him off and let him have him. And then uh, his foot was much bigger. And so I, I kind of, I said, bless you, Dad. And I put my shoulders up to see if my coat would fit him. And it wasn't fit him. And much bigger. Didn't have no shirt, just an old coat on. And I thought, poor old fella. Maybe never had a good, decent meal in his life. His old trousers, ragged and dust all over him. And you're the devil that even blinded him. And there I was walking across there saying something. And I thought if my daddy would have lived, he'd been about the age of that old man. And I thought, oh, God. And I put my arms around him. You have to feel for the people. If you don't feel for it, there's no need to pray. You don't have compassion. And I put my arm around him. I said, don't say this, Brother Espinosa. They don't interpret the prayer anyhow. So I said, Heavenly Father, be merciful to him. And I had my hands they want like that. Y'all are glory adios. That means glory to God. He looked around like that. And the old man could see as good as I could. There he went walking over the platform. But uh, the next night, they had a, about oh, almost from here to the door would be the platform. And just old shawls and old ragged clothes piled up there to be prayed over. And it was pouring down rain. They couldn't get... They'd come there that morning around 8 or 9 o'clock, and I wouldn't be there until that night about 8 or 9. So there's so many people around. No seats to sit down in like you got. They leaned against each other. And standing there in that rain, the women with their hair all down wet, just waiting to hear the word of life. And um, General Valdia take me in. I guess you know it. I mean, he's one of the Christian businessmen. First Protestant ever taken in under the government protection of General Valdia in Mexico. So then I was, that night I caught in. They let me down on some ropes back out the back of the ring. I come down into it like this by ropes from back off of a car. And while I got down into the ring, I walked over there. And Billy come to me and my son, he said, there's a fellow there that had been giving out prayer cards. I called him manana. I means tomorrow. He was so slow. And he never would come get me. So uh, he'd give out the prayer cards. And Billy said, well, he said, uh, Daddy, there's a woman down there has got a dead baby. And you all seen this article in a businessman's voice. And he said, uh, she's got a dead baby. And said, uh, uh, we haven't got no prayer cards. And said, I've got around 300 ushers that can't hold her. And she, she's a little bitty woman, this young lady, very pretty young woman. And she was, um, had this little dead baby and a little blue striped blanket on it, holding it, a little stiff arm about this long in her arms. And been standing there since that morning. The baby died at 9 o'clock. And this is about 10 that night. And so she was holding this little baby in her arms. And um, I said, uh, said, I said, well, just tell them ushers to hold her off. If you put her in with them people holding a prayer card, I said, it'll make, uh, and I said, won't you tell her to come around? I said, you can't tell her nothing. I said, she just won't listen to it. And I said, well, enough ushers over there surely to hold her off. I said, you can't do it. I said, Brother Moore, I mean, knows Brother Jack Moore. He's, uh, uh, I said, she wouldn't know the difference between you and I. She don't know me. I said, you go on down there and pray for her, Brother Moore. He said, he said, all right. I said, you go down and pray for the baby, and that'll satisfy her, and she'll go on home. He said, all right. So I turned back around, and I was speaking on faith in the substance of things hoped for, and about Jesus and how he did when he was here on earth, speaking to him. And just as I started to speak, I looked out in front of me in a vision, and there was a little dark-faced baby. Hallelujah. And he was, he was laughing at me. And I looked again. Brother Espinosa said, what is it, Brother Bram? I said, never mind, Brother Espinosa. Just keep the crowd entertained just a moment. Now, when I said, wait a minute, Brother Moore. And so he had done got down to where the, little, where the little woman was. And I, I said, tell her to bring the baby here. And so here she come up on the platform. She fell down on one knee with a rosary in her hand. She was saying, um, Padre, and I, means father. You know, I said, stand up now. Stand up, stand up. Got her stand up. And I said, baby did. She couldn't understand. The tears running down her little face and her hair stringing down. Now, this is true. There's my Bible. And see, I put my hand over on the little baby, and I thought that was satisfied. I didn't know what that was a baby. I couldn't see it. And I said, Heavenly Father, I said, uh, before me was a vision of a little baby. And maybe this would be the one. And if it is, I pray thee, Lord, to honor this little woman's faith. 
to give her baby back. And just then that little fellow split out a scream and began to carry on. Just as hard as she could. And um, the little woman, she didn't know what to do. So she, uh, I told Brother Espinosa, I said, now don't you say, wait, you go and let a doctor sign the statement to that. And in the voice, the Christian businessman's voice, just recently, it appeared, see, before you write anything, you've got to have evidence that that's right. Doctor signed the statement. The baby died with pneumonia, all respiration left him that morning at nine o'clock in his office. And this is ten something that night when he come back to life again because a little woman was persistent. If God could open the eyes of a blind man, he also could give her a baby life. He's still the same God tonight, man. You've got to be persistent to achieve something. Or she should have listened and said, well, the baby's dead and just give it up and go on. See, this, see that same faith that lived in the women like the Shunammite woman, it still lives in people today. Once in a while they can strike that something, not a put on, not a make-believe, but something that's real. Something that's, that's genuine. Don't you think we can do that tonight? Now, we are going to pray for the sick, laying hands upon them in the name of the Lord Jesus to pray for them. Now, um, we probably can have the line through in about, oh, perhaps 20, 30 minutes. Now, we can't stop for a discernment. You really understand that because it'd be so much. But we're going to pray and lay hands on the sick. Are you ready tonight? Do you feel in your heart something's anchored? The presence. How many has been here in the meetings through the week? Let's see your hands. I guess practically all All right. How many has never been in one of the meetings before? Raise your hands. Well, my, that's ha- Well, I guess some can't get in. Well, let me just say to them, because some of them may have a prayer card. Divine healing is something that God has already done. See? It's something. We believe, and I believe with all my heart, that the Bible of Hebrews 13, 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and forever, he's the same. And I believe that the life that was in Christ should be in us if we're Christians. And he said in St. John 14, 12, He that believeth on me the works that I do shall he do also. Amen. said in St. John 5, 19, I do nothing till the Father shows me. Is that right? Amen. Now here, for instance, here, every one of you, as far as I know, is strangers to me. All right, I want everybody to be real reverent for a moment. And if Jesus Christ doesn't appear among us in his same power, then I'm a false prophet. Don't listen to me no more. How many here doesn't have a prayer card? You won't be in no prayer line. Raise up your hands anywhere you're at. You look this way and pray with all your heart and believe. This is a hard, it wasn't, didn't come prepared for this now. But I know we ain't got much longer to stay here. Now I'm going to take every spirit in here under my control. In the name of Jesus Christ. Now sit still. And if you don't believe, uh, better keep your head down. But if you're a believer, the Bible said that he's a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. And how did he act when the woman touched him? He turned around and knew who she was and what was wrong with her. He perceived the thoughts of their heart. Don't you believe he's the same today and forever? If you have a need, you pray now. And what is you? What are you talking about, Brother Bram? If I'm his servant and I claim that his life is in here, then the same works will show themselves. Now you know a man can't do those things. It's impossible. But Christ remains the same. I want you to believe that. Anywhere in a building, I want you to have faith in God and just believe. And you say, Lord Jesus, the man doesn't know me. And I've been hearing about this, but maybe it's so it may, I don't know. But I know he doesn't know me. And I know if he could tell me, I says your healing's already done. If Jesus was standing right here now with this suit on, and he gave me, he could not heal you. How many knows that? Your Bible says he's already done. Amen. See? See? He could prove that he was Jesus. Same yesterday, day, and forever. Not by nail scars, his life. Anybody could have nail scars and wear a long hair, maybe in a beard. We don't even know he was dressed like that. We couldn't say that, that was right. See? But any man could do that. But his life is what it is. His life in you. Now you pray. And you say, Lord Jesus, let me touch you. 
and find out whether he remains the same yesterday, today, and forever. If he'll do it, would you believe? You know, that's what he did. That proved he'd be Messiah. This little lady sitting here keeps looking up at me and putting her hands over her face and so forth. You, have a, you don't have a prayer card, I suppose. You, I mean, the little lady. You don't have a prayer card. No. All right. Do you believe me to be God's servant? If the Lord Jesus Christ then, we're perfectly strangers. We're, we're a different race one from the other. But if I can just speak to you, sitting in front of you is a good friend of mine, Mr. Dow, from down in Ohio, who had a complete heart failure not long ago at 91 years old. Doctors give him up and everything. I started to him. He's a lovely brother. He and his lovely wife sitting there. They're good friends of mine. And I started to him. And I was just coming out of a filling station, trying to get to him about a couple, three hundred miles from me. And I was driving as hard as I could to get to him because she called me and said, Bill's dying. Complete heart failure and a heart attack. And 91 years old. And I started out of the filling station. I seen Bill standing before me, walking to me on the street. I come with, thus saith the Lord, he won't die. Here he sits right here now. It's been months ago. He's got much faith. He's sitting close to this woman. She's sitting right behind him. He believes. She's believing too. Now, I don't know you. But if Jesus Christ, while we're talking, wanted to like our Lord talk to the woman at the well, if he'll tell me what's your trouble, what you want or something, well, you'll know what's the truth or not, won't you? It's for a son. And that son has a mental condition. It's a, if that's right, raise up your hands. If that, that's, that's right. That's right. All right. If you will believe with all your heart and take that scarf that you wiped your face with, lay it close to him and don't doubt that conditional evil. Now, the very God that can tell you, don't you doubt. Can't you see what's happening? Look, right, right, this woman going right to her, sitting here, a uh, uh, colored lady. I'm a stranger to you. But there's something you're desiring. And me being a stranger, another race, just like our Lord and the woman at the well, one a Jew and the other is Samaritan. If God, have you got a prayer card? You don't have a prayer card. I mean, this little lady with a red striped dress on right there, yes. All right. I, I, I don't know you. We're total strangers. Is that right? And now, if God can reveal to me what's wrong with you or something, you know where it's right or not, won't you? Frankly, there's nothing wrong with you, only you have a hungry heart. You're seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. If that's right, raise up your hand. Then you will receive it. If you will believe with all your heart, just don't doubt. Have faith in God. Mm -hmm. You believe with all your heart? I want you to believe with all that's in you. Here's a lady sitting here looking right at you, right down the aisle here. She's suffering with a heart trouble. I hope she don't miss it. God tell me who she, she's Mrs. Fitzgerald. You believe with all your heart, you can have your healing. Raise your hand. I'm a stranger to you, is that right? Your heart trouble is gone. That's your name? That's right. I don't know, you never seen you in my life. The lady right behind you, she's got a lot of faith now. She's got a prayer card in her hand. But the lady is suffering, and being the Holy Spirit, that light hanging right over the woman, yet yeah. uh, she's suffering with a, she's got a, a tumor in her neck, and she's also got a fallen stomach. Is that right, isn't it? Just lay your prayer card on the floor. You don't need it no more. Do you believe with all your heart? Just have faith, no doubt. Here's a man right back here, that tumor. See that devil? Thought he'd miss it then. There's a man sitting right over here that's got tumor. The tumor's in his back. 
I don't know the man. I've never seen him. He's a total stranger to me. But when I seen that devil go out there, that black shadow, and then I see it run over this way, it went to this one for mercy. They're trying to congregate around there. Satan thought he had missed that. He, I'd miss it. But the Lord showed it to me. The man sitting right here, he's got tumor in his back, and his name is Mr. Carson. If that's right, raise up to your feet and be healed in the name of Jesus Christ. Do you believe? Have faith. If you, here's a woman sitting here. She's got a kidney trouble. She's got complications. Her name's Miss Bird. That's right. Is that your name, lady? Am I a stranger to you? Is that trouble we have? If it is, stand up on your feet and accept your healing in the name of Jesus Christ. Go ask those people. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Don't you, don't you realize that His presence is here? Yeah, that's my son telling me, Bernard, I'm going to say, I've got a meeting tomorrow and tomorrow and on and on. See, I challenge any man or woman in here to believe you couldn't hide your life if you had to now in the presence of God. That's exactly what our Lord did. That's exactly what He promised in the last days. That's exactly what happened before Sodom burned. That's exactly the last sign that would come to the church. We're here now at the end time. Do you believe it? What's your prayer card now? All right. I'll tell you what would be best. Let's take the people by the sections. He says there's many prayer cards. Now, you see God is here. Now, is there any ministers? This is all right, Brother Vic. Is there any ministers here, brethren? Now, I'm laying hands on these people. I don't want them people to go say, Brother Branham did this. See, I, I'm just your brother. Your pastor has just as much right to pray for the sick as I do. He might not have this gift. No, he hasn't. I mean, he's only one of them in the world of time. <laughs> See, that's what the Bible says. See, that's right. And that's, now, notice. But your pastor is ordained of God, if he's a believer, to pray for the sick. And I'm asking some of you minister, brethren, to come here and stand with me while we pray. Let some God... Spirit-filled ministers that believes in prayer for the sick, with, along with Brother Vic, Brother Bose, where's Dr. Lee Vale, and some of them that uh, would come here. So that the Bible said these signs... Let's stop right here, brother. And how about right here? Come right here. Yes. These signs shall follow them that believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. you believe that? Do you believe we're in the divine presence of Christ? Amen. I just want you to see, because I spoke the way I did, it was for a purpose. <laughs> the purpose worked right. Great things are fixing to happen if you'll just believe it. Now, I'll tell you what I want you to do, brethren. I want you to divide up half on one side and half on the other and make a little alley like you here so the people can come. I'm coming right down with you. I'm going to ask someone who is a song leader that would come here that could lead songs I want to go down there and pray for the people somebody who can stand here and direct the people that's going to be prayed for thank you choir for giving us that's mighty nice that you giving us that room to come like that alright let the ministers line up this, like this right face each other see like this like the brother and I like Billy and I here stand like this one with the other Now, how many has prayer cards on this side? Let's see your hand. There's quite a number. I suppose it'd be best if we could let them come out on this side and come right down along the side, this way. Now, before you, let's say uh, the first part of the line that has cards, let them line right up over here, and we'll start praying for the sick and laying hands on them. I wonder how many here tonight is it's all right and well and you're interested in these people getting well. Raise up your hand. Sure you are. Now remember, will you pray with me? You pray with me. Now you pray with your pastors. Now to you sick people that's going to line up and be prayed for here, remember, when you come to this line and these ministers and myself touch you Remember, it's just an act just the same as you were baptized. 
you've come having hands laid up on you by believing ministers that God promised that the prayer of faith shall save the sick and these signs shall follow them that believe these men come here to testify that they believe in this ministry and they are come here as associates to with us together we're all of one accord we're in one place at one time it's time now for the healing but if you don't believe it don't come because it won't do you any good see you've got to believe it now do you believe now let's just bow our heads just for a few moments and we're going to sing slowly now Everybody with your head bowed, Lord, I believe, only believe. Now, everyone together, let's be praying now. Let's imagine seeing Jesus coming down off of the mountain. What Jesus? That same Jesus that's here in the Holy Ghost form. Same one that knows what's in your heart, whether you really believe or not. The same one that knows all about you. Tells you night after night, it's him, you know, it couldn't be me. And now, after his, his presence, now the little silky open woman, remember, after she got in the presence of Jesus, still she had trouble. You're going to have trouble. When you come through this line, I want you each one to believe that you're going to be healed. If you're not, don't come in. Don't, don't, just don't take the other's place. Stay there until you have enough faith that you're going to be healed. And then God will grant it to you. Now, those on my right side here, line up over on the side while the rest of us sing, only be you with a prayer card. Some of the boys will be standing here to receive your prayer card as you come in the line. Over on this side, the right-hand side. Go out on the right-hand side if you possibly can, because it will confuse them. Start this way. You can't go backwards. You have to come around this way. See, have to come one way. Go around. If you, brother, just step back there and let them come through this way. It's a bit, may seem a bit confusing because if there's such a, a, a group of people to be taken care of. But now, watch my son, Billy Paul. Watch the ushers there. They'll tell you just how to do it. Won't be a bit confused. Then you see on this side, as you come through the prayer line, then you go right back to your seat. And then we'll take this other side, and they'll come from that way and come through. See? Now we'll stand here, just vice versa the line, from one side to the other, and pray for them. All right? Now I believe if you, brethren, will move down just a little bit so these brothers here can get in. Right here so we can all be laying hands on the sick. That's just fine. Now listen, brethren, each one of you, each one of you, brethren, do you realize what you're doing? See? You know the position that God's put you in. Uh, this challenge is your faith. And just remember that you're going to believe that every person that you touch has to get well. They just have to do it. God said so. I'm going to touch them with you. And I believe they're going back to be well. Don't you believe that? Amen. Let's just have a word of prayer among ourselves. While the rest of you go ahead lining up, we're going to pray for the condition of our own faith. Heavenly Father, there's many sick people here, and some of them, Lord, still believe that they should have hands of the elders laid on them. That's all right, Father. We know that you taught that. You said these signs shall follow them and believe. If they lay their hands on the sick, they shall recover. You promised it. The people believe their promise. Your presence is here. No one can doubt that.
they didn't realize that the unseen Christ is standing amongst his brethren, standing here now, to bring to them reward of their faith. And I commit it all to you now, Father, in the name of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Now, I want everyone else, have your heads bowed. Listen close now to your instructions. If you don't, you're just taking a walk. Now, remember, if God will let me know the conditions and so forth, and you believe that, now, just take my word. You've got to believe that this settles it. If it doesn't, it might make you worse. Settle everything. If you've got sin in your life, step out of the line and confess it. Don't come in the line until you're prayed through. And if you're going to use your life for something besides the glory of God, don't come in the line, see? If you're ready to make a dedication to Christ, fully surrendered and fully persuaded that this is Jesus Christ, this great Holy Spirit here, and if you're going to receive your healing when you pass through this line. No matter whether you feel different or what, you're going to be persistent to hold right on to God's promise until the victory comes like that other did we talk about. Do you feel that way, audience? If you do, raise up your hand and say, I accept that. I don't see no reason for anybody going out of here sick tonight. Now, I want you that's not in the line to pray. I guess Brother Joseph is going to stand here to lead the singing, and I'm going to get down here so I can pray to and lay hands upon these people as they come to. Now, look, friends, the services will be tomorrow night. We don't know what will happen. Somebody getting healed and screaming and praising God and so forth, we might get uh, not officially dismissed for a while. Now, but... Please stay and pray with us. We need you right now. Pray that the enemy will not be able to crowd any doubt in these people's minds. What if that was your mother standing there? Your sister, your wife, your husband, your baby. You want somebody to pray real sincere. Remember, it's somebody's mother, somebody's sister, brother, somebody's child. And we want to be sincere about this. And when we pray, I want you, man... With all your heart, when you lay your hands up on these sick, believe that God is going to make that person well. Because they're going to breathe. And I, between now and tomorrow night, while well, before I come on the platform tomorrow night, there ought to be three or four hundred testimonies going right here. Of, I was wearing crutches. I, was, I, I don't have them no more. I was sick. I'm not sick no more. Within the next 24 hours, they will also be leaving this place. And it, because the blessings is pronounced upon the people. Now let us bow our heads as we pray, each one as he passed to the line. Now, brother, just laying your hands upon the signal. Don't you feel right now? How many believe that you're healed? Passing through the prayer line, you're time after time after time it happened right here. Now before they got away from the platform, I believe that each one of you will be well. Well, I believe it. I accept it for you. My faith goes with you that they will be well. You believe that, brother? Oh, my. Isn't he wonderful? Let's just now sing a praise to him before we're dismissed. And then let's just raise up our hands and hold them up high. And remember, we've been through by the cross. And there's where we got the light. At the cross. Oh, my God.